Hello out there everyone. This is Andrew Kimmins with Kimmins Toolworks and today we are starting the week off with some pretty cool new stuff. And to me, that is a huge, huge chunk of the fun and a big part of why making custom tools is a meaningful thing and why I enjoy it as much as I do is because I, I, I like to make new things that are suited to people and their needs and everything in front of me today really tells that story and many of these are, are completely new things so <clears throat> without further ado let's check this out and we will go down here and talk about it a bit now obviously we have some size differences here with what's shipping out today um, these are really big chisels, if you haven't noticed that. These are really, 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 really big chisels. I figure you probably already noticed that, but if not, huge. Um, they have extended handles versus the regular framing chisels. This is a regular size handle, and these have roughly a two inch extension, maybe a little bit more. Um, not to mention, I was only making these up to two inch. I had a customer that wanted a two and a half. And I said, you know what? Sure, I'll do that. Sounds like fun. Um, <clears throat> this is a monster, absolutely monster tool. And it's a little smudged up because this isn't my first take. I tend to screw up the first video. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is a monster blade. And the biggest challenge to making a tool this big is to get the fit and finish on par with the smaller tools. It's not nearly as challenging to get a, a, an above and beyond fit and finish on a small tool. It is extremely challenging to get the proper fit and finish on the big tool. But I spend the time to do it. I take a lot of time to make sure that everything goes together as it should and that it's finished properly. And even though it's a big chopper, this is a very rough use tool, I still want it to look the way they need to look. And of course, I would never in a million years send anybody a tool, even a giant two and a half, that I didn't suck it up and lap it. I lap everything. When you get it, it's good to go. Take it out of the box and you go with it. And that's what I like. Now, compared to the two inch, I mean, it makes the two inch look pretty small. And that's not, that's a two inch chisel. That's a two inch framing chisel. That's a massive tool. I mean, absolutely massive. But that two and a half makes it look small, believe it or not. So we have that, these are going out today, and these actually go, will be going out with them. I wanted to mention too, for those of you who don't know, this is uh, curly hard maple. This is actually pool cue material. It's been graded and selected for pool cues, and it tends to be extremely good quality. So I use this for the big, you know, high stress, large tools like framing chisels and, and things of the sort. These actually are also made with that. These are new sizes. I was doing mortise chisels from eight to a half. Half was my cutoff. And now I'm going further because there's been enough demand. There's been quite a few people that want bigger mortise chisels than, than half inch. And, you know, who am I to say that's not necessary? I don't use ones bigger. I don't even use a mortise chisel that's even a half inch for the most part. But... You know, there's a lot of tools I don't use. And I know a lot of people do a lot of big things and need a lot of big tools. And so I'm always willing to take that on. The greatest limitation is, you know, my equipment. So sometimes I just don't have the stuff to do a particular job. But if I have the equipment to do the job, I will almost always take it on. And this is a case of that. Um, this is a three quarter inch mortise chisel. And I mean, this thing is enormous. This thing is enormous. It's a monster. 
absolute monster tool. And a lot of people have wanted these, so I will make them. And I'm thinking about since I'm going beyond half inch and I'm going up to three quarter, I might as well go to one because I've had a handful of people that request one inch mortise chisels as well. And the thing is though, when you breach past, they all cost about the same from eighth inch to half. When you breach past half inch, they get expensive. They get expensive because the size of the material that goes into making these is absolutely enormous. And the amount of machining that goes into making these is crazy. And the it, it's just really extensive. So they become much more expensive. And, you know, it's, it's the same with these. It's like, these are not cheap tools. They're very expensive tools. And that just is what it is. It has to be. Otherwise, they wouldn't be, you know, very good. And when I <clears throat> was first starting out doing a lot of things, people were upset that they couldn't, you know, get a chisel for $50 or something like that. But the thing is, it's like, tools like this, the, the slab of steel to make these two, I bought a two and a half inch by three foot slab of steel because the tangs are super long. The just the blade material to make these two chisels was over $120. So those are 60 bucks a pop just in blade steel before I do anything to it, you know. And then we're talking extremely high grade curly maple, we're talking $110 a gallon resin, you know. We're talking stainless bar stock, all the machining time. It's a very, it's they're not cheap tools, they really can't be. And same of this really large material bar stock goes into making those and it's not cheap so <clears throat> and that is what it is you know it's one of those things where you don't buy these types of tools because you want cheap crappy tools that's what amazon's for you know and i've had a number of people contact me and they're like you know i'm i'm looking for a just a, you know a general use for around the house set of tools i'm not really a woodworker but they're really pretty and i tell them i was like honestly i would just start by getting something on amazon if all you're doing is you know chopping some things around the house every now and then it's like if you find that you like it and you get into woodworking and you really want a nice set you know then this is the direction to go if you want professional grade or or tools that you know let's say you're very passionate about woodworking or you want to start woodworking because you became passionate about it and you want the best set ever so that you just have them forever then this is a great place to be but all right let's talk about this right here because this is an extremely special little set and i put a lot of time into this little set right here um this is a special little set of butt chisels first off i love butt chisels i really do because like these little butt chisels are the greatest little chopper little mini choppers ever and they're just they're awesome i mean these are awesome i love these things and right here what he's got is a one inch a three quarter and a half inch really good sizes like if you're gonna do three butt chisels that's a good place to be in my opinion, because, well, for, for the things that I do, because I would tend to use them for little stubby chopping tasks, you know what I mean? <clears throat> but this set's really special because of this handle material. He sent me this handle material, and he's a guitar player, and this handle material came from the Gibson Guitar Factory, and it just has sentimental you know, meaning in, uh, in, in that way. And it, this material, it's a particular type of rosewood. I'm not sure what it is, what exact species of rosewood it is, unfortunately. But what I will say is that this, I believe, and I've been thinking about this for a few days, I believe that this was the smoothest turning material I've ever put on my lathe. And I mean, and we're talking about I turn a lot of Coca-Bolo, I turn Ebony, I turn all kinds of extremely just 
buttery smooth woods. This went beyond that. And why that's significant is because you can always tell when you're turning a piece of wood how it's going to finish. You can get a rough idea. Now, it's a very rough idea. That doesn't always necessarily equate perfectly. But this stuff was just absolutely like butter. And I mean, to be smoother than Coca Bolo or Ebony is really saying something. And <clears throat> I've been trying to get pictures and stuff like that to do these justice. And I just really can't. It's just absolutely beautiful material. And it's just, it's just such a cool little set. Like, and I still have one piece of this material because he sent me enough for four handles. And I might be able to, um, he wants a 5 8 if I can make that fourth piece work. So I'm going to try and do it. And just, just to see, you know, that other piece of material has a little crack, but there's probably enough of it to where that'll turn off because it's extra long. Um, so yeah, that's always an option. If you have some really sentimental material, you can always send that in. I can make chisels out of it. Um, in a lot of cases, I can stabilize it with great success beforehand. In some cases, I can't. In very, very resinous, very sappy woods, they do not stabilize very well. Um, some do and some don't. That's why I have this sitting out here because I wanted to talk a little bit about stabilizing in general. And when I, when they come out, this is a piece of curly hard maple. When they come out because they need heat cured after, after they go in the vacuum chamber, they're submerged in resin. I run a series of two vacuum pumps and I do whatever is necessary to get all the air out. And if that means it takes a day, two days, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, this is what I like to see after it's heat cured is that sheen of resin coming out of it. And you might think, well, that's kind of wasteful because that's not going to anything. And I agree, but this is the only way that I know the material took the absolute maximum amount that it could. There's no other way to know if it could have done better. But if you heat cure it at the lowest possible temperature and you get this thing to take as much resin as possible, it will hold as much as possible. And that's why I don't mind some waste on the outside of it, even though that resin's $110 a gallon, you know? And believe me, it does not go far. When you're maximizing the amount that a piece of material takes, a gallon of resin does not go very far. So <clears throat> I wish you could feel the weight of that because that does not even feel like wood. That is, it feels like ultra dense heavy plastic or something and but it looks just like wood but that stable stabilization makes it turn and finish smoother so it's really an, a necessary and integral part of the process for durability and i take stabilizing very seriously and i've had pre-stabilized blanks i've had a number of those in my shop and i will tell you they don't feel like this. Like I've bought pre-stabilized blanks. I've had pre-stabilized blanks sent to me and it's not this. I think that a lot of, a lot of people like online that sell pre-stabilized blanks, I don't think they take it this far, which, you know, in a lot of cases, sure, I get that. You know, in a lot of cases, people are just trying to dye them and that makes perfect sense. But I am going after absolute, utter durability. And that's why I take stabilizing very seriously. Because I take every aspect of this very seriously. And I, I like to think that that shows in the end in the finished product. But um, every part of it's serious. I take that seriously. The only thing I never take too seriously is myself. You know, that's kind of my own policy is it's like, eh, I know I'm, I'm kind of a, kind of a goon most of the time, but that's okay. Whatever. I have fun. So these are the new things. Some of the new things that are shipping out today. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to uh, mention that, let me bring the camera back up here really quick. 
I have a number of people that ask me if I'll do a, a shop tour. And I will tell you, it would be like probably the most completely uninteresting two minute video ever. Like it's, it's literally a thousand square foot shop that I just work in myself. And it would be pretty much, you know, a little bit of a eccentric circle around this table that I'm sitting at right now. And that would be it. So it'd be a terribly boring video. Um, so yeah, that's why it's not a huge priority. It's like, it's pretty small, but I don't need a whole lot of room. I wish I had more room because if I had more room, I could jam more equipment in my space and do more stuff, which that'll be coming eventually when, when the time is right. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to go ahead and I'll wrap it up here for the day. And it is Monday and I better get going. So I hope everyone has a great week out there. And if you want some really big mortise chisels or really big framing chisels, as always, you can get a hold of me at uh, Andrew at KimmonsHandTools.com. Andrew at KimmonsHandTools.com. And that is pretty much the best way to get a hold of me is by email. And that's the only way to get anything because everything I do is custom. So if there's something that you are looking for or something that you need, just send me an email, andrew at kimmonsandtools.com. Tell me roughly what you're looking for. We can make just about anything happen for the most part. And when I say we, I mean me because it's just me. But uh, yeah, and I, I do also have social media and stuff like that. I just don't really have the time like I used to be able to get on there and like post things every day and talk to people and respond to people every day. If I tried to be as engaged in social media as I used to be, <clears throat> I would not get my work done because it's like, I, 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 you know, thankfully it's like the word of mouth has just kind of gone which is great because people never trust you like because anybody could say anything you know I could say I was freaking Batman and it's like eh, no, you're, you're not Batman but the thing is it's like when other people that have bought my stuff you know tell other people then you know that 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 tends to work but it's like yeah there's so much fraud and so much BS out there these days and everybody claims to be we're the best whatever I have, the best this or that or whatever, and it's just all crap, it's just all BS. So, I know, it's it's hard to, <clears throat> it's hard to find many genuine people out there, but that's why I like to make these videos. I hope that, you know, you can see genuine quality in the things that I do. They're smudgy, I need to clean them up before they ship, but... And... If you wonder about edge retention, look back to a video that I have on my on my thing where I take one of the scrapers and the scrapers are a little bit softer. They're about 62 Rockwell. I push the chisels up a little bit higher than that. Uh, if you if you start going past 63, you start losing toughness with A2. So I tend to stay in the 63 area and I, I like that area. It works extremely well for A2. But <clears throat> the scrapers end up about 62, maybe on the high side, sometimes 62 and a half, because there's always a little bit of wiggle room in steel because like every day is a different day. Every day is a new day. Every piece of steel is just so slightly different. But you can see in that video, I'm, you know, chunking at aluminum with it and like twisting it. I don't, I don't go easy on it when I'm doing edge retention tests. It's not like I just try and shave little slivers. Like I'll cut and twist just to try and break and chip the edge. Because like, think about the amount of torque. Like this is one of my personal chisels here where it, if you just plunge into that thing and then you get it into a wedge of, of a material like aluminum and you just twist it, you can, if, if it's going to chip and snap, it's going to chip and snap in that test. And that's why I use that test for edge retention testing. And ultimately that's the reason I started making tools is because it's like, I, I can get 
extraordinarily good edge retention with relatively common steel. Like A2 is a common tool steel. And I've had many different chisels and cutting cutting tools out of A2 that was like this just isn't what it could be. And I know that a lot of manufacturers ship their stuff out to facilities to be heat treated. And you know, that's their thing. If you're dealing with, you know, $100,000 worth of product a day, yeah, you, maybe you can't have a giant heat treating facility, I get that. But like, I heat treat everything here and I have my own proprietary process that I use that is different as far as I know than anything else being used in the world. And I had to completely invent and engineer equipment very specifically for the heat treating of my blades. And thankfully it works extremely well. And you know, to hit 63 Rockwell and keep a blade straight, that's the trick. Because 63 Rockwell on A2 wants to do this. It wants to go, it wants to do some crazy things. But see, you can manipulate soak times and stuff like that, and you can change that a hair. There's a lot of little things that go into it when you're, when you're heat treating steel that all add up to the end result. To the end result of a piece of A2, you can just chop at a piece of aluminum and twist it and torque it and stuff like that. And, you know, no chips, shave hair still, you know? So my chisels are the same way as that video. So if you want to see the edge retention, it's not like I'm just making, you know, super beautiful tools that are going to be horrendous pieces of crap for you. Because I have a lot of customers that come to me where they've gone to other people and they've, you know, had Damascus tools made. And they're like, these things just chip, they break, they crack, they have no edge retention. It's like, yeah, Damascus is artistic. Damascus is not performance oriented. It's not. It is highly defective steel. That is what it is. Damascus. If you're looking for performance, that's not the place to go. If you're looking for performance, the only way to go is a machined steel that's heat treated properly. And that's the only way to get there. It needs to be machined from a piece of steel that came from a reputable mill that knows how to control the grain structure just right. Because grain structure matters. When it comes down to the grain structure of a piece of steel, that's your final edge. That equates to what kind of edge you're going to get in the end. So that really matters. And I know in a lot of, a lot of my tools sometimes you can actually see little bands of the grain when you hold it just right in the lighting and it's pretty i think it's really pretty but it matters every little tiny minor detail in steel matters and in heat treating matters and that's why i started doing this to begin with and yeah if you're curious about the edge retention check out the video i don't just make pretty pieces of garbage i make highly functional tools that I just so happen to be able to make pretty. Function came first. Function came long before pretty. Pretty took time and effort and experience and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of practice. I don't even know how many hours of practice. The pretty came after I had a, a fully functional blade that was like, okay, this is really good. And everything has just gotten better and better and better to where you know, I, it's been a journey and I think a lot of people don't, they kind of miss the whole, the whole point of like, I don't make these to just be pretty show pieces. I make them to be as good as they look. And that's just important to me. It's important that everybody knows that, that, you know, if you're going to get some of these you're going to get a good performing tool so anyway i hope everyone has a great week out there and i will see you next time